Thank you. Thanks for sticking around too. <laughs> so Ramal, uh, when I you know, was trying to think about how I would have this conversation with you. <laughs> yeah. I mean, also, I, I'm just sore, so. so. <laughs> well, um, one of the things, <laughs> it's, it's great, it's very um, Sorry, dramatic. I should Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, one of the things I was thinking, you know, just trying to think about how I would talk about this film is just, it's so intensely cinematic, you know, I feel like it's, it's really truly a piece of cinema that's important and self-reflexively a piece of cinema uh, and, and some, an important contribution to the canon, I think. And so all, all, of the, all of the questions I have kind of cut essentially to what is the essence of cinema in some kind of roundabout way. So oh, That's cool. <laughs> um, so first, yeah, I was, you know, I think the film has this really... Uh, incredible texture of memory like it's like almost like a recollection of lives lived it feels it feels like authentic to the experience of of of, of having lived and remember and sort of being through something and i was just kind of wondering about what what you how what value you kind of see in allowing something to unfold before your lens without necessarily going out and actively sort of seeking something yeah um yeah, I don't know. I don't know how to to sort of answer that. And to also, um, thanks. Um, also, the co-writer here, Mike Krinsky. I just want to say thanks. It's, everyone can acknowledge. Um, and then um, I think Charlotte's here too from FOV, and they were a big supporter. So I want to thank them. Um, but in terms of, I don't know if I, I. I don't think of it in terms of value. Um, I think personally, the moments that remind me. I don't know. I, I think that's also what I was about to say wasn't wasn't true. Um, <laughs> I think what I'm most interested in, in some sense, is like the sort of you know a person leaves you know 20 miles away and like makes it through traffic and then like gets to this point and then this person over here goes through their day, spills their coffee, slows them down, gets to this point and then like what happens when all of these seemingly random things, but also on the trajectory of culture and the trajectory of human life and progress and evolution. Um, sort of coincide to create a moment which is like ultimately human and, and possibly um, choreographed and possibly fictive, but only something that can happen because of the spontaneity of like sort of humanity in some sort of fundamental sense, you know? And so I, I as it relates to cinema, you know, an early question was like, what if you could, you know, participate in other people's lives in a way in which you, 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 these things happen because you've spent enough time there, you know? You're there for long enough to walk out of a trailer and then all of a sudden the storm's like being born right there, you know, it takes a long time. Um, what happens if you make a film that is actually composed of what I deem to be the most incredible elements of life, like those moments of life, and then like how does that compound life in the cinematic form or something and like, like what if cinema, this is so cheesy and abstract, but like what if cinema could be life? You know, if cinema could be alive, it could be real life, could you create a consciousness or something by like compounding moments or something? And I think that's really interesting also given that you're a your photographer as well. And, and uh, there's a lot of mention of the idea of time in the film and time and what you've just said to us now, this kind of sense of simultaneous like, life just happening kind of simultaneously. And as a photographer, you, you capture that instantaneous moment that then implies movement but, but is in itself kind of frozen, which is different to making a film where things unfold through motion in, through time. Um, and, uh, you know, it happens at different levels within the film. There's a kind of the time unfolding in the shot, and then there's also the time sort of in a sort of bigger scale. There's, there's intimations to, you know, other, other you know, parts of history, and there's uh, archive uh, footage sort of dropped in there, and there's a kind of sense of a grander scale of time as well. I'm quite interested in that transition for you as a, from a photographer to a filmmaker and time and how that works. Yeah, so that's like a really obviously a big question, yeah. which is something that's like attempted to be addressed in whatever way possible um, in the film. You know, like the film is kind of the inquiry and the, the sort of best answer um, that someone could give. But and just in terms of the way in which I think about photography and film and time, um, like the photograph is such a uh, a singular thing that's supposed to inside the frame of the image and also referencing what's outside the frame in some sense contain everything possible. 
right? Like one person takes a photo, and this is everything in some sense. Not someone taking a fo the photo of a flower or of like a cloud, unless it's like steam glitz or something, doing something a little bit different. But um, you know, one thing that separates that from the way in which people traditionally use cinema cameras is that they make moments that are meant to prove the next moment, you know? And so, you know, you follow someone, and you follow someone, and this scene is what this is, and then that makes this a little bit more valuable. So what happens when you sort of add a time-based element to the idea that this is everything, you know? Like that, you know, Quincy holding his phone with, um, with uh, Carmen. It's like, I can't, there's so many K names um, in the world. Uh, Carmen and his and and Boosie calling him and it says wifey on the phone like that frame right there to me says everything about the film you know so what happens when you add time to that is that it just like it allows you to participate in the everything um, and then what happens when you bring those things together in a in like a, a sort of interesting form it just like it does something bizarre to history I think history and time and and movement in that it just like it's able to almost span and scale and like drift between um, ways of being in the world or ways of understanding the world, I think. I think that um, ways of understanding the world, picking up on that, uh, I think also the film really feels like it's trying to find a new language, uh, a new way to speak about things, a new way to look at things particularly. Um, and I'm quite interested, uh, maybe you could speak a little bit about uh, representation and and cinema's sort of implication in the past. I know there's a there's a shot at the end of Audrey Hepburn. Uh, you know, there's this kind of like yeah, yeah. sense of like you know, cinema has can can't be removed from the ways in which we understand ourselves, and certainly in America today, uh, and in terms of si trying to find a new way to represent people and to understand communities, it's important that we have a totally new visual language to do that. And I feel like the film is doing that. And I'm interested in how much of a conscious process that's been for you and how you think about that. Thank you. That's really, that's really kind. It is, it's attempting that, but I think in way more of a, a sort of humble way than like, I'm going to create a new form and a new language, you know? Um, it's very much, you know, like imagine, um, I, don't, I don't know how many people of of color here there are, but I, you know, and I imagine this is also the case for people not of color to some extent in other ways, but imagine like going through the world and like always seeing pe the way that people look at you and the way of you being in the world is never the way that you really are. You're like forever being told who you are and forever being told what your potential is and forever being told, um, actually just forever being told. Um, and so as that relates to cinema, you know, like cinema is it, it was like uh, the the literal best friend of racism, you know. Like in some uh, in some conceptual sense, it's the material of racism, right? You have this idea that people are inferior based on X, Y, or Z, and then you need proof of that. And so, how do you prove that? You prove that with a photo that fulfills someone's expectations that you planted in their head. You fulfill that with a film. Um, and so, to me, you know, those that medium being telling people how to th think about myself and other people like myself. Um, is most damaging because it never included voices. I hate voices. It never included the subjectivity of people like myself because that subjectivity um, is kind of what the film was supposed to do. It's just like, so what's my, my sort of like Mount Rushmore for my experience and for these guys in, in this place? It's like just the way in which I think about images and the way in which I collect things and the way in which I imagine things being related to each other. And then therefore it presents a worldview that is like, it's, it's like called radical, but it's also just because black people just never had cameras. You know, like I can't imagine that. <laughs> I can't imagine that there's a, that if <laughs> black people would have had cameras in the same way that, you know, black people had jet music, or think black people had literature, that there wouldn't be something, something else than like the way in which, you know, sort of corporate America has sort of capitalized off of the idea of blackness to perpetuate negative ideas of blackness. And so, um, yeah, it's a really it's a really big conversation. It's in a really and it's it's not something to me, um, in all honesty, that like is very conceptual. It's actually the process of just thinking about myself in the world. Like I came to these conclusions by making images and going to the South and um, just being a photographer who who cared about the the content and the relationship between the form and the content. And then you you come to those conclusions. It's like it's like a, it was natural natural logic for me, you know, in some sense. 
think that's revolutionary in itself. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I want to open it up uh, to the audience right away. Um, uh, we'll start here and then we'll go over there. Um, do we have a spare microphone? Um, I wondered if, um, because you showed some photographs of your students this morning. Oh, yeah. I repeated one thing I said this morning during this talk, and you know what I thought? I said, I hope that no one here <laughs> was in that talk. It was, it was very good. I'm better than that. Um, <laughs> I'm better than that. And I liked the film as well. Thank you. But uh, I was just wondering whether <clears throat> um, the, the people in the film have come from your student group um, and whether or not I was interested to, uh, suddenly I just thought um, did they wonder why you were using the camera in the way you were for example when Kyrie is running back I think it was Kyrie running back and you know um, or very close up on somebody's head or did did they wonder about that um you know, I wondered about that, you know, because in all honesty, you know, like it's very much just about, and, and you know, which is what my images, you know, and unfortunately, all right, I'm going to, okay, so this is a problem in that I, I'm going to forget the questions just because uh, of the way in which I, I like to talk, but, but so remind me when I don't answer them. Um, the, uh, the image that they showed at the beginning with, of my student was the one I actually least wanted to talk about. It was the other ones, because the other ones are sort of the development of the understanding of the problem of that image, you know? Um, all of the, Quincy Bryant was one of my students, yes. Um, and Daniel Collins was a guy that I coached at the high school before um, I started making the film. So I actually knew those guys for three years before I made the film. And everyone in the community knew me as um, the guy that ran the GED program. You know, like I was making images, but my job in the community was to help people get their GED, to get workforce development training, to, you know, once again become productive citizens in this, you know, in this, these productive times. Um, and so they were comfortable with me f to some extent, but I always had a camera as well. So they just knew me as the guy that was community worker and a guy that was like, like taking pictures. So for them, you know, because they accepted me, I was just the guy that liked shooting. And then when we started to make a film, obviously I shot a lot more. Um, but it wasn't, yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't strange. I mean, I'm sure that to some extent, it's, it, it's hard for it not to be fil strange being filmed unless you were always filmed. And then if you weren't, that would be strange. But I don't know. <laughs> Did you ask some? <laughs> I had something so much better to say, too. <laughs> I'm sure it'll come back to you. <laughs> oh, man. Um, it was one of you here. Question? <coughs> there, someone? There. Thank you for your film. I found it very moving. And you said your co-writer is here. I was wondering what did the writing process entail? Because it seems so spontaneous. And also, double question, um, I love the technique. So I was wondering, how did you shoot it? The sound is really good, even though you can't see microphones ever, yeah. and I wondered what's the camera and how was uh, the setup there? Um, so, you want to answer the co-writing question? Um, yeah, so I guess one of the main questions was about how much of life to show and what are the main events in life that, that should be shown or can be shown over a period of time in the characters' lives, um, protagonists' lives. Um, and how much not to show, and how much how to weave those things together in order to create sort of an experience of life while also, um, I don't know, maintaining the the authenticity of Ramel's experience of life there. So it was a lot of conversations and a lot of um, kind of collaborative editing, and um, that was the main part of the process. Yeah. Do you want to add to that? <laughs> I'll talk about that one. So the writing was less about the literal title cards. Um, I, I wrote those, but you know, talked with Maya and talked with Jocelyn, a producer, and talked with um, Rob Moss, another person on the editing team, um, about you know 
the tone of them and you know the length and how to make stuff more accessible in some sense. But um, the film had uh, we had 1,300 hours, um, which is an act actual absurd amount. You know, um, doesn't make any sense. I wouldn't recommend it for most people. But that's what it takes to sort of for things to to happen in the way in which they did. You know, um, and so what was your question? Oh yeah, so excluded, um, excluded most. You know, like there's there's a, the film seventy six minutes, and so, you know, I don't know how many. Yeah, it's just yeah, it's definitely a matter of curation, and it's and it's a matter of like, I feel like the I feel like the writing, I think the co-writing, it's kind of it's a little misleading. It's more like um, conceptual guider or like conceptual. Um, you know, yeah, I think like like Watchdog, right, as well, because there's for a film like this in which you're you're only showing the the, the protagonist like six times, seven times during the entire thing. Um, the contingency of the images is it's like an, an infinite like rabbit hole, right? And so you know, if you show something early on, it completely under it can undermine something. You know, 20 minutes later, you had no idea because it's not a scene; it's an, it's a it's a moment, and those moments are have to be highly potent and highly sort of neutral in the sense that they have to guide you away from certain ideas, um, as opposed to give you certain ideas. Because you know, the film's intentionally open, obviously, so you fill in the gaps. You know, suspend um, conclusive imagining, as so they say. But um, that's more what the, the co-writing title was. Maya was like the first person that I even showed footage to and talked to her about the ideas I had behind the film and trying to figure out how, what not to do is the, is the biggest challenge, you know, in some sense. Um, and didn't you ask, you asked another one. Oh, camera and sound. So the entire thing was shot on a Mark III with a shotgun mic. So all the sounds perspectival, someone walks away, like their voice fades away, which I think is really great. It really centers. Um, it's a really important idea in the film in that the film is supposed to be literally about what I'm seeing in this place while participating in the lives of the protagonists. It's like less about shooting their lives and more about being in it, you know? Um, and so we went back after we had a rough cut. Um, the sound guy, Dan Timbins, who's this like sound genius. If any of you guys, he's really hard to, because to, he's so busy to get a hold of, but um, He's like an amazing sound guru, and so is this guy, Tony uh, Valente. Those were the two sound guys. But Dan and I, once we had a rough cut, we went back to Alabama, and we were like, OK, we have Daniel dribbling. And so the sound's really shitty. Then let's re-record the sound in a gym in Alabama. So we re-recorded everything that, we, that was missing, that sort of fullness. And then we went into the sound booth and like started to play and to make it you know, really full and thin and all those you know, adjectives that people use to describe sound. Um, we'll go up there. Uh, beautiful movie. Thank you. Um, do, do you think about the audience, who you'd want to see the movie? Does it ever cross your mind? Oh, God, yeah. You know, if, if I wouldn't have thought about the audience, it would have been like a, an installation, you know? And not that people that make installations, which I do, don't think about audience, but that's like far more of a sort of niche thing. The, the film was, it, it attempts in, in, to the best of my ability to like dial it just beyond the line of documentary film, like just cross it just a little bit so that um, it sort of uses that, that currency of truth so you guys can be like, oh, I just watched a documentary film and this is what I saw, so therefore the community can be seen that way, like I can see this way, this is true. Um, but in terms of like, you know, what the audience takes away, quote unquote, or what the audience uh, can get from it, I think the only thing I truly considered was making the film as literally beautiful as possible, and as you know, contingent on you know beauty and moments. Because I, I, in some sense, I felt like if a person could make it through the film, then they have to be changed. If you if you see moments that aren't traditionally shown of people, you know, in, of the black community. Um, it's almost, it's almost in, inherent in the nature of imagery. If you show someone a new image there, it's part of their archive, you know. And so um, that's actually good enough for me. 
Um, but if the person is a little bit more inquisitive or a little bit more sensitive, there's a lot to take away from it. And so for me, once again, it's like hook the person with that sort of fundamental element of attraction, um, but have that be incredibly substantial. Uh, we'll go here and uh, we'll, we'll start here and then we'll go there because we can pass the microphone now. Hi, um, I think it's really cool that it kind of doesn't follow typical narrative structure. Yeah. It doesn't play by the rules at all. And I was just wondering, like, um, was there ever a temptation to have it be more character driven or were you just always set on it being really observational? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, it actually, the first three months, it, so the film was shot for five years. First three months, it was character driven. And then I made an edit and it was awful, like it was actually awful. And it may not have been literally awful, but it was actually awful. <laughs> Don't you guys, that's just, just the other relevant distinction. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so I made, I made the cut and I was like, oh, this is super underwhelming, you know, and then I would, then I just like went and pulled these moments and I was like, oh, and I made like a, like a five minute collage, not collage, but a five minute version of this and then I was like, oh, what if you could do this for an entire film? And then boom, like, you know, the film sort of idea was born about three months in. Um, and then after that, there was kind of no looking back for the traditional side. But it, the film is, is literally, I, and I hate saying this because it might not be uh, absolutely true, but I think in some sense it's true. Like, any conscious black cinema is in opposition, you know? Like, it's not not following the guidelines because the guidelines are are inherently colonial in some sense you know or inherently um fetishizing or inherently pointing at the other like the camera is the camera is the the most uh efficient othering machine in the world you know it's more othering than like being a human which is already inherently othering um and so yeah it, everything was like in response. I was like, oh, I can't actually show this moment in Daniel's life because this moment falls into this category. And when people come across this category, everything after that category is kind of lost because the person's framing it in that category. So it has to be here, it has to do this. And then, and then it starts getting fun when you're like, when you're actually free, if you're, once you're freed from narrative, I think, or free from arc, like that's like the most fun in the world. You know, that's like running on water or something, you know? Go to the question in that way. There's a microphone coming the other side. <laughs> Hi. Um, just following on from that, I really enjoyed the, the fresh approach to it. But how difficult was it not to fall back into working in, in, to, in traditional storytelling? I was like, you know what? Once you realize that you're not going to do it, like, what, like once you realize, like, you know, when... God, I, I wish I had like a really good analogy. It's like once you realize you're dying, you're like, I'm dying. <laughs> All right, you know. And some people sulk. I would probably sulk, you know. But um, it was really easy because one, I wasn't interested in that. I had no expectation for the film. Um, as we started getting funding, and as more people started becoming interested in it, I was like, oh, maybe this film will actually be could have like a really nice life in the world and actually change things. But at the beginning, and almost halfway through. I had no intention of making that film. You know, like I was making something with a very specific motive and a very specific goal. Um, I wasn't, I'm, I'm not, I was, though I was leveraging my life to make it, I wasn't staking my life on it, you know? I wasn't thinking, I'm not thinking of filmmaking as a career, though I plan on making work in the future and, you know, and continuing to do artist stuff. But um, to me, it was like, it was my thing, you know? It wasn't, it wasn't about, wasn't about narrative. It was actually, it was literally actually about the opposite, and so that was the motivating factor. It was about another version, like a para, a para narrative, I'll say. Another question. I'm gonna go to the back. That's true, right? Sometimes you gotta check in on truth. <laughs> that's why. That's that's like the writing process is checking in on truth. You know. Sorry. Hi. Um, uh, yeah, I love the film so much. It's a beautiful experience to watch it. And Thanks. just to, um, yeah, to kind of like spend time with that family. Uh, it was just the atmospheric way that you pulled it all together was amazing. And I wondered what 
they felt and what they kind of discussed with you when they saw that portrait of their lives, if, if you've had those discussions with them? Yeah, you know, I haven't yet. I, the two uh, main fellows, Quincy and Daniel, came to the premiere and saw it. Um, no one else has seen the film. We haven't, uh, Boosie hasn't seen it. She's been dying. She's like asking me for DVDs and stuff. And I refuse to until, I want her to see it in a place in which everyone's giving her the attention that you're giving me, you know? Because that was one of the most, that's one, one of the purposes of the film, right? Is to like elevate the experience of Daniel and Quincy in that community. To, one, to cinema, uh, another to popular mainstream attention, um, another to just like fucking beauty and everything that's kind of been um, almost deprived of, of um, deprived as a gift for them. And so, you know, I want her and I want Mary and I want the rest to, like when Quincy and Daniel like watched themselves and then like it was incredibly moving. They were sitting beside me, blah, 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 blah. We went on stage and then someone like raises their hand and they're like, Quincy, I just want to say that you're just an amazing father, you know? And like, Quincy's never cried in front of me, but that's as close as he would because, you know, I don't know where all you all come from um, in terms of, you know, relationship to whatever. This is, that's a, that's a bad line to go, uh, to go down. But no one, like the, the historic South, specifically rural communities, are wildly ignored, right? And so they are, like, undereducated, they're under cared for, and they're under... They, they don't participate. And so to have someone say that to him, um, I'm, I'm sure would change his life, you know? Um, and yeah, so I'm excited for the moment in which the rest of the people in the film can know how wonderful they are. You know, stuff that our parents told us or stuff that we sort of feel on and off for whatever strange reasons. Um, and so we're gonna have tons of community screenings and whatnot, but because of the theatrical distribution strategic thing that um, all of the brains behind the machine uh, do. We have to just wait until all that stuff's possible. Is there another hand? Here we go. Um, I just wanted to ask, because it is quite an unusual approach to making a film, um, if there was a point where, when you were shooting, where you knew that you had enough, or there was a point where you got to where you're kind of like, okay, I think I've got all the things that I need. I know you talked about doing some kind of conceptual planning before, but was that quite difficult to get to a point to stop as well? Obviously, you shot over five years, I think you said. Yeah. That's a good question. It's like hard to know when to stop, you know? I feel like this is a spontaneous analogy. I feel like it's like for if someone was like crazy rapacious and just like only cared about money, it's like, and they were just making like a ton of money. That's kind of what the film was for me for shooting. And so I had no idea when to stop. I would have just like made money or just shot forever. Um, I had enough money. I had enough of a film probably along, probably within like a year and a half, you know? But to me, you know, it's really, it's really addictive to, to like, to be surprised, you know? And that's what happens when you, uh, when you live life. And so, you know, which is one of, I think, most profound things about making the film was that like in some sense I almost got to live like two other lives because I became so close with the guys and I was like you know we're hanging out and stuff but I'm also watching a lot closer than I normally would um and so like this I was sometimes I would leave the stuff that I witnessed that's just banal was not something that you would traditionally witness you know and so it's kind of I would leave sometimes and just like be kind of in awe of the sort of the the God, because that's like the most interesting thing in the world is to like be able to live another life or something, you know? Like everyone, to get out of your own head is the most impossible thing. So, um, what did you ask? When to stop. Oh, when to stop, yeah. <laughs> so you, uh, so once, once we had, you know what? I think the eclipse, it was the eclipse because I was already filming, you know, the moon and the stars and all that kind of stuff all the time. And then the eclipse was coming and I was like, this would be a good time. Also, I had an amazing team. Like, honestly, I think the best team possible. Like Jocelyn Barnes, genius. Maya, genius. Rob Moss, a genius. And we we knew that it was just it was time. We had we had the material. Um, and it wasn't now or never, but you know you can put stuff off until you know you die in a plane crash. You know. 
got to make it. God, that was so dark. <laughs> <laughs> I apologize to any person with aerophobia. Is that it? <laughs> we have time for Sorry. possibly one more question. Um, if there's any, if there are any left in the room, um, looks like we'll close it off on that dark note. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's not even what I wanted to say. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you for a really, like, it's really an amazing film. And uh, thank you for bringing and sharing it with us. And thank you for being here uh, to speak about it so beautifully. So. Cool. Thank you. Thank you.